Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of History Quest. As promised, we are going to some of our neighboring museums to check out what they have. Here we are at the Carver County Historical Society in Laconia, Minnesota. I'm here with Jeremy and Jaina and they're going to show us around the museum today. Brian, well, thank you for uh, stopping by. We're excited to show you around here today. Uh, we are, as Brian said, we are located in Waconia, 555 West First Street, right across from Bayview Elementary. Uh, and you can't miss us if you're coming down First Street. Uh, we've got a big World War II Sherman tank sitting out front, so a nice landmark to let you know that you're in the right spot. Uh, we are standing in our entryway right behind us. You can see uh, our research library that is open to the public along with our museum. Uh, our research library contains a lot of family genealogies, our newspapers on microfilm going back to 1862 is our first issue that we have. Uh, up until uh, 2012 we have on microfilm and we've got some more years that are going to be coming to us soon as well for the public to access. Uh, so if you need to do any sort of research, this is the place to come and do it. And if you don't know where to start, we usually have a library researcher in there, or we're here, or one of our volunteers is here. Somebody who will know where to get you started, and how to run the microfilm machines if you've never done that before. So Exactly. Uh, so yeah, in our facility here, we have a number of different exhibits, uh, including a few right here in our entryway. Uh, we've got, uh, right now, we have a display case dedicated to the work we are doing on the Andrew Peterson Historic Farmstead just outside of Waconia here to the east on Highway 5. It is a National Register of Historic Places property, uh, and we are currently rehabilitating it to what it would look like around 1885. Uh, so right now, the interior of the house is almost completely well, not completely demolished. We have it uh, down to the original log structure in some places. We've got most of the plaster all stripped away as well. Uh, we're redoing that uh, and replacing windows, bringing it up to uh, restoring to what it would have looked like inside the house around that time period when Andrew Peterson and his family would have been living there. Are you doing any of the work? In the <laughs> uh, Every take apart work. Yeah, uh, sure. a little bit of like taking samples of stuff uh, because we got to do paint analysis mm -hmm. and uh, get samples of wallpaper, a few of the different layers of uh, multiple decades worth of wallpaper that we have here in this case. Uh, so all that sort of stuff that we want to document because while we're rehabilitating, we also want to document the history of the mm -hmm. house and everybody who has lived there over the years as well. Now the burning question on my mind right now is that tank. Does it run? Can I get into it? <laughs> and is it weird if I wear an army helmet? Uh, well, never weird to wear an army helmet. Um, you cannot get into the tank. Oh, the hatches okay. have all been welded shut. Oh, and okay. before we even got it in 1964, 65, somewhere around there, uh, we got it from Camp Ripley uh, by Little Falls. Uh, they had pulled all the mechanics out oh, of it, so okay. there's no engine in it currently, so. It just makes a really nice landmark. All the kids know what I mean when I say you can't miss it if we're next to the tank. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, with that, can you give us a little tour of the museum itself? Absolutely. All Let's right. head on in. go. So yeah, first uh, when you come into our building, uh, most people come into our veterans exhibit, Extraordinary Sacrifices. Uh, this exhibit is dedicated to the men and women of Carver County who have served in the armed forces, uh, going back from the Civil War up through Spanish-American and Philippine-American Wars, World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, and then the uh, more modern wars against terrorism in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, so the items and the displays that we have in here showcase a bunch of items uh, relating to Carver County veterans that we have collected from the veterans or their families themselves. Uh, a large portion of the items in here are, were also collected by a uh, longtime Carver County service, veteran service officer, Dan Steinhagen. So what do we have here? Who are, who are these photos of? 
So this display uh, element right here, we have over 600 photos of Carver County's uh, servicemen and service women uh, that we currently have photographs for. Uh, we have well beyond 600 uh, residents who have served in the armed forces. Uh, and we are always looking to add more uh, photos of our servicemen and women to this display. Uh, so for anyone who has a Carver County uh, veteran, uh, either anyone who called Carver County home is usually how we decide who's, who goes up in here. Uh, if they felt like Carver County was home, if they were a veteran, if they have a photograph, we would be happy to display it in this element here. for pretty much the immigration to Carver County and what Carver County was like growing up here, um, becoming Carver County from all of our Swedish immigrants such as the Eustis family whose display is here. They settled up by uh, Swede Lake, um, the uh, part of the settlement that would eventually merge into Watertown, the still existing town, an entire wall of immigrant trunks that help us showcase what it's like to try to pack up your entire life into one, albeit sometimes very large trunk, um, and bring it all over here to start anew, and then just breaking it down into various other things. We've got a little bit of dairy paraphernalia in this corner, talking about farming and the dairy uh, industry that was here. Um, giant log piece that helped showcase what it was like to come out to the big woods and have to cut down trees, not only just to start your farm, but to build everything you needed and down to basic accoutrements like building your different kinds of uh, furniture, the quilts that you would bring with. And then going into things that were more important, your books that would have helped them connect again with the uh, family and culture that they had left behind, religion that does much the same thing, and then down into specifics such as one we have here for the Pioneer Manicor, it often off to the side here which uh, talks about the German man singing choir and then also Stiftenfest, which grew from them. So uh, most places in central Minnesota, there's, there's some kind of Native American history. Um, I think basically the southern half of the state, it's uh, very much a Dakota history. Yes. What does Carver County have in terms of that? What, what can we learn about Carver County and Dakota history? Sure, well, we have a dedicated exhibit um, our Act of Dakota to honor the people that was put together in cooperation uh, with the Milwaukeean Sioux community uh, across the river in Shakopee. Um, and they are the descendants of the Dakota bands that uh, would have used the majority of Carver County as uh, hunting grounds. Uh, all the settlements that we know of of the Dakota were actually across the river on the, Min on the Scott County side of the Minnesota River, um, where modern day Shakopee is and a few other smaller villages along the southern shore. Um, so no known settlements that were actually within Carver County, but they used this area for uh, hunting, gathering, um, up until, I mean, there are several accounts that we have from some of the early settlers, uh, including Andrew Peterson, um, talking about uh, hunting bands of Dakota, uh, Dakota who would still come through and stop by the farms, maybe do a little bit of trading, um, uh, get some food from the settlers or some tools from the settlers, and next day they'd have a deer laying on the front porch as a, as a trade-off with them for uh, interacting and sharing the land. Uh, and so we've got, in the exhibits, we cover um, everything going back to uh, early civil civilizations, uh, Neolithic, uh, Paleolithic um, humans who were in the area, so uh, flint shard or fragments of stone that they would have chipped away their implements for making flint knives, flint spearheads. Uh, we have a, recreate, uh, a reproduction of an addle addle, which is a large throwing spear that they would have used for hunting mammoths, uh, the uh, 
ancient ancestor of the bison, uh, any of the other large game that was around this area at that time, uh, up to when they started uh, doing more settled occupation of areas and creating pottery, uh, create, or starting agriculture, fishing and gathering and stuff like that. Um, Waconia is actually in, we're finding, is in a fairly interesting area, actually this whole area around Carver County and the surrounding counties. Um, because as they are doing archaeological work out on Coney Island, the island out here in Lake Waconia, uh, they have found uh, pot shards that are showing uh, a mixture of processes and markings between a very distinct northern uh, Minnesota type of pottery and a very distinct southern Minnesota portion or uh, type of pottery. And the pot shards they're finding out on uh, Coney Island are actually showing a, uh, a mixing of those two uh, techniques. So this is sort of a melting pot area uh, and exchange, exchange of ideas area uh, well before even uh, white settlers came to this area. Yeah. And then the exhibit also covers um, areas of when white settlement did start coming into the area, uh, fur trade, uh, with the French and British fur traders uh, and how it started to open up this area for white settlements and then also a, an army radio handheld radio may I'm seem like ask why yes that, in there. that may seem like a very odd uh, piece to have in a Native American um, exhibit uh, but that is to pay homage to the uh, many Native Americans who uh, still serve in America's armed okay. services today. Okay, so one of the first things I notice when I walk in here is this. There is so much color, so much design here. What can you tell me about? This is Material Pulses, Seven Viewpoints is the brand new traveling exhibit that we just opened today. Um, it's our traveling exhibit space finally back in use after everything. We're very excited about it. But it's, a, it's technically speaking a textile art exhibit. Um, I won't blame you if you default to calling them quilts because they look a little <laughs> bit like them, but it is technically a textile art exhibit, kind of leaning into that quilt area. Um, and yeah, it's a lot of bright, wonderful colors. The curator that put it together, Nancy Crow, was really looking into talking about some of the other sides of quilt making in the modern era, not always looking at the very like neutral colors that have been coming out in the general pieced quilts, um, following the more standard quilt styles. And just going back to the bright, bold colors that you could get in older quilts um, and the kind of shapes and just the artistry that you can get from them. So while these are more art pieces than the quilts that you're going to get to just throw on your bed, although I personally would throw that one on mine, <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're amazing and they really do talk about what quilters are able to kind of do that maybe people don't think about as much. Um, so this exhibit is actually going to run from today, April 6th, until May 25th. We are open Monday through Friday and it will be open on Saturdays as well. So. Now this is something. What, what? Tell me about this. This is amazing. Well, I don't know its full history. I do know that this is a quilt that was pieced together by a variety of Carver County women, uh, and it was more or less spearheaded by Audrey Sells, who's very well known for the quilts that she made. Um, she has since passed away, but um, her quilts are still extremely well known in the area. We also have a second one next to this one. Um, but this is our, as we call it, the Carver County quilt. It kind of showcases various different landmarks and some of the different um, communities within the county and even one that doesn't necessarily have a, as much of a community today down here in the Assumption General Store. But landmarks that are well known to somebody who lives here and has lived here a long time. And so it's a group effort kind of showing off all these different things, whether it be Bongard's Creameries, um, having um, uh, going up to Crown College and various different portions of the of the states, and so they took pictures and then pieced together using various fabrics to get that in there. One of my favorite things is they actually went out and found some that just plain old had horses or cows printed in them, 
So they're in there and you have that full range of this is a farming community in certain areas still. So what in the world is this? This is technically the most art installation portion of that textile art exhibit that we have up also in the other exhibit space. This is called Momentum. Um, so it's put together with tool and ruby lids. And ruby lids is all this plastic red stuff that you see here. Um, it's used in making like movie film or tape to that effect. Um, and, and it's something about the way that she does her mark making in the way she makes clothes, so how she has them particularly sewn to the tool is part of her quilt um, you know, textile portion of the exhibit. The rest of it is really a giant, interesting art piece for people to look at and question themselves, what am I looking at? But it's very cool, it has some wonderful shadows. And we also even have the best part, a touchable piece on the wall that people can satisfy that particular curiosity. <laughs> Minnesota Museum would be complete without an agricultural exhibit. So this is your agricultural exhibit? Yeah, so this might look a little small for what you'd expect for a part of the uh, state that was known as the Golden Buckle of the Dairy Belt, um, mostly for our large number of dairy farms that we've had here in the past. Um, but it does touch on a variety of different things, whether that be the, all the things you can do with milk here with your butter churns, including one that says try me, satisfy all of those kids out there. Um, but also <laughs> um, things like uh, Waconian sorghum. We used to produce a, quite a bit of sorghum out this way, which is no longer the case and part of the history that's maybe a little more easily forgotten. But also another chance to get to talk about Andrew Peterson, um, and his work with apples, which is really what we focus on when we talk about his agricultural side. And he was a horticulturist. He really wanted to find a species of apple that would survive a Minnesota winter. And it took him a while, but he was doing pretty good for it. And he was recognized by the more or less the precursor to the Arboretum for it. And then, of course, you can't forget the Carver County, the home of Grim Alfalfa. So that's another portion that we get to talk about where we've got um, the alfalfa and what it took for Wendelin Grim to get that going and then how that really contributes to why we were the golden buckle of the Delta Dairy Belt. Speaking of Grim Alfalfa, um, for those who may not know the story, um, he brought a five pound bag of Avigar clay, which translates to um, mountain clover from Germany with him. He grew up, or Wendelin Grimm was born in Baden-Württemberg region of Germany. And he brought that five pound bag of seed with him, established it here in Minnesota, uh, keeping the seeds through seed selection of what survived the hard winters and just kept replanting, kept replanting, kept replanting uh, until he developed uh, what became known as Grim Alfalfa, which uh, is the, um, what all modern strains of alfalfa is based off of today. Uh, and in history, uh, an exciting little tidbit about that, the crate that he brought that seed over in that we have in our collection is actually going to be making a trip back across the ocean to Baden-Württemberg uh, later this year for an exhibit uh, at the House of History in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, so they will be borrowing that and several other items relating to Wendell and Grimm um, that will be going back to Germany uh, to help share his story. So this looks like quite the display in here. Um, what, what can you tell me about it? I see a lot of a lot of woodworking tools and very interesting. Exactly. Yes. Very good eye. Uh, this is our recreation of the Gottlieb Westerman uh, turning shop, or sometimes referred to as a spinning shop. Uh, Gottlieb Westerman had a farm uh, just outside of New Germany, Minnesota, uh, not far from McLeod County at all, uh, and he not only farm, but he was also uh, a very talented woodworker. Uh, and as you can see here, we have his foot-powered turning lathe that he would turn um, pieces of wood on to make furniture, to make uh, 
like little spindles for spinning wheels, stuff like that. Uh, he would make that on his foot power turning lathe, uh, which you can imagine is probably quite the workout. <laughs> he probably had uh, legs the size of the trunks of the trees that he grew up around. Uh, and the Westerman farm has actually stayed in the Westerman um, and Kellerman family uh, for well over 150 years, just outside of New Germany. Uh, so it's part of that uh, long lineage of people who came and settled this area and have stuck around and made Carver County such a wonderful place. The burden question on my mind is it still operable? Uh, for the most part, yes. Uh, given the age of those belts, we don't usually try to do that though. Because <laughs> we don't want to break anything. Right. So this is your collection room. This is one of our five collection storage oh. spaces for all the items that we have not on exhibit currently. Uh, our collection uh, contains roughly 13,000 3D artifacts, uh, about 16,000 photographs, and roughly 200 linear feet of archival material uh, that we hold within this facility. Uh, and so yeah, it's just one of our areas where we keep these. This area is mostly our fabrics and household items. Uh, so all the boxes that you see here, those are all holding uh, garments, dresses, wedding dresses, jackets, pants, all that sort of fun stuff. And then as you see further down the uh, shelving here, uh, we've got kids' toys, household appliances, cooking utensils, uh, our entire shelf of sad irons. Uh, as well as um, our rolled quilts. And in the cabinets over here, we've got some of our archeological uh, materials. I notice you have a thermometer here. We do. Yes, we've got a thermometer and a humidistat uh, for monitoring temperature and relative humidity in our spaces, uh, both storage and exhibit spaces, uh, because one of the biggest things with uh, maintaining historic collections like this is you want to maintain uh, a very a fairly steady um, temperature and relative humidity because otherwise that keeps the items uh, safe from like, expansion and varying temperature and humidity uh, changes that can lead to mildew or drying out and all stuff that could potentially damage these artifacts. Now are you like every other museum where you have not enough storage space? For all your items? Absolutely, yes. Uh, <laughs> if we have any, if, if one of the many things we have in common with other historical societies is that we have way too much stuff for the space we have <laughs> available. And we're probably about 110, 115% capacity when it comes to storage. Well, I'm glad I'm not alone. In that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for showing us around at the Carver County Historical Society. It's uh, definitely, I'd say, one of the, one of the best museums I've seen so far so thank you very much and for everybody watching right now if you have time make sure to come down before may 25th to check out the traveling exhibit that they have going on right now and also stay tuned again next month as we go down to new Ulm for the brown county historical society tour and lastly be sure to come down to the museum on may 4th as we're doing our second annual will be fest this year we know you had such a great time last year so we had to do it again so all right thank you everybody take care we'll see you next week